Hi everyone, welcome to part two of the plasticity lecture. During part one, I described some very small scale phenomena occurring at the atomic scale. In this part, I'm going to ramp this behavior up to link to the macro scale. We've talked about how dislocations only move due to shear, and I told you the yield point of a metal is where these dislocations start to move. However, there's a lot of ground on the length scale to cover between these very small scale phenomena and the overall macroscopic behavior of metals. We know that metals have features which extend from the nanoscale through to the micron, and these can collectively decide the behavior at the meter or so scale. So in this part, I'm going to bridge that gap, and along the way, show how we can go from a far field tensile stress back to shear and moving our dislocations around. The movement of dislocations leads to slip in crystals, as shown here for a 2D depiction of simple cubic structure. For example, for an edge dislocation, there is a plane and a direction that a dislocation can move on the easiest in terms of driving force. Slip occurs on planes that have closest packing in directions that are closest packed. This is because the atomic arrangement here reduces the overall driving force to move them. These concepts were covered in the interatomic bonding lecture. Depending on the crystal type, some will have more slip systems, that is, combinations of both planes and directions which slip is favorable. On the top right is a depiction of a close packed plane and directions for the FCC crystal, and below this is the same for BCC. These two diagrams show the collective slip systems for FCC and BCC, respectively. It can be immediately seen that there are more slip systems for FCC than BCC. BCC only has two preferred slip directions, while FCC has three. With this in mind, let's now resolve how a uniaxial stress can move dislocations on these systems. Consider a small section being loaded with two principal stresses, sigma 1, longitudinally, and sigma 2, laterally. The maximum shear stress that occurs in the situation is given here. If these two principal stresses are equal, then the resultant on an arbitrary plane does not generate any shear. If sigma 2 is 0, then there needs to be some resultant force acting on an arbitrary plane which balances the normal force with a shear stress. In a uniaxial tensile test, the maximum shear stress occurs on a plane which is oriented 45 degrees from the loading direction, and sigma 2 is 0. Keeping sigma 2 0, depending on the orientation of any arbitrary plane, sigma 1 will range between some maximum value at 45 degrees from the loading direction and to a minimum at 90 degrees. In order to achieve yielding, and therefore some movement of dislocations, some critical value of shear stress needs to occur on some planes. Let's now have a look at that. If I take some of my crystallographic planes, which are oriented with the same plane of principal shear, then I'll end up with this happening. My uniaxial stress has been decomposed to shear on this plane, and if the uniaxial stress is high enough, then I'll have movement of a dislocation on this plane. Repeated many, 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 many times over, I will end up with a wholesale movement of the crystal. If this is repeated over numerous grains, then we'll have what we observe by eye, ductile behavior. This is why plastic behavior is irreversible. You will need to apply the exact same amount of shear on the exact number of planes and hope that the exact same dislocations untangle if you wish to reverse it. This is impossible. What we just looked at was for a single grain with a single orientation. We know that grains can have all sorts of crystallographic orientations due to how they solidified. Metals are almost all polycrystalline. For these circumstances, what happens is that slip will occur first in a grain which is best oriented with the plane of principal shear. 
other grains with favorable crystallographic orientations that are further away from the plane of principal shear will slip with a higher apparent uniaxial stress. There is a second factor which polycrystalline materials encounter. Dislocations move to grain boundaries and cannot translate over to subsequent grains for the same reason, a lack of coincidental crystallographic orientations. We can now describe some of the features of the stress-strain curve as it starts to enter plasticity. So at the point of yielding, we have a collective movement and the interaction of dislocations. The degree to which this occurs initially is down to orientation of the grains, the underlying crystal structure, and slip systems available. As the stress increases, more grains start to slip, and the dislocation density increases due to dislocation interaction and piling up of dislocations at grain boundaries. There then comes to a point where no more dislocations can move in some grains, and we end up well on the road to failure. For an idea as to how the dislocation density increases, here are some numbers for aluminium. When solidified, it will approximately have 10 to the 7 centimeters per cubic centimeter of dislocation density. Heavily deformed, it will have two orders of magnitude more. These are both fantastically large numbers, but is the crux of this lecture. It is the collective behavior of dislocation movement and slip on preferred planes many, 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 many times over that produces plasticity. This plasticity is what we observe over distances measured by micron to millimeters and up. Let's now apply this appreciation of plasticity in describing the macro scale behavior encountered during a uniaxial tensile test. We can apply dislocation dynamics to describe the stages of a ductile failure, starting from when the necking occurs at the ultimate tensile stress. Necking first occurs because at that particular point, the stress required to deform select grains is lower than elsewhere in the material. These grains then start to distort to form voids within the material, coalescing to form a flaw in the center of the specimen. The remaining material at the edges of this flaw are locally at much higher stress than the rest of the material, and as a result, grains on the periphery have a higher driving mechanism for slip. This ends up propagating the crack along planes of principal shear, creating features known as shear lips and this eventually results in characteristic cup and cone type failure. This type of ductile fracture is less serious than brittle fracture in engineering applications, since fracture can be detected in advance due to observable plastic deformation. So in this lecture, I've bridged the link between dislocation dynamics that occur at the atomic scale and how they collectively act to generate phenomena that's observed by the naked eye. Indeed, many features of fracture surfaces can be interpreted by applying an understanding of how dislocations move and interact. It was made clear that the plastic behavior of material is dependent on the ability for slip to occur, as assessed through crystallographic orientation and number of available systems relative to the applied stress. This in turn affects the overall dislocation density. In the next lecture, we'll discuss ways to disrupt or modify dislocation movement and interaction, strengthening mechanisms. Until next time.